1996 was fantastic, but 1997 will be as good, if not better. Perhaps there's only 10 games in this first episode, but going off the list I've made for the whole year, I can pretty much guarantee an abundance of bangers. And it all starts with... Okay, the game. And when I say multiplayer, I mean you've not seen a game like it. Because while in single player it can get boring rather quickly, with friends there's hardly anything comparable to it in the fun department. Especially if you keep in mind that up to 10 people can play together on a single PC. How is that feat of computing Jedi mind trickery achieved, you may wonder? Well, by use of USB hub and 10 cheap USB controllers, preferably 2 per cable. And if 10 seems like a bit too much, I agree, it kinda is. With that many players, the game is literally crazy chaotic and any kind of strategy that you usually employ in Bomberman like clones is mostly moot until there's like 5 or 6 of you left only. Before that, the unpredictability is overwhelming and you'll be focusing on surviving more rather than anything else. Still, when there's 5 6 of you, it's short of magnificent. I think that while I've been spitting out words here for a good minute, I still haven't really said anything about the game yet, have I? Well, in my defense I assume that everyone knows what Bomberman is. But on an odd, one in a million chance that you don't, let me try to explain. It's basically a versus multiplayer single screen arcade game, where each of the players controls one Bomberman and they have to use bombs to kill each other. Bombs explode sending horizontal and vertical blast waves of fire, which can change their size during gameplay with use of power-ups. Explosions also remove destructible walls, often uncovering bonuses of various kinds, like extra bombs, stronger explosion blasts, ability to throw bombs over obstacles, ability to kick them, and that's just an odd few out of many more. Naturally, the last Bomberman standing wins, and when you killed off, you stay that way until there's a winner. It may sound basic, simplistic even, but whomever played any iteration of the game with at least 2-3 others will tell you that it's a blast. Terrible and way too literal pun obviously intended. If you often play a game with friends locally, you know, on a couch like we used to back in the day, and don't have a video games console, then this along with worms perhaps should always be in your gaming rotation. Period. Betrayal in Antara is a fantasy role-playing and a follow-up to 1993's Betrayal at Krondor. It doesn't follow the predecessor's story or even use the setting though. Instead, it starts a new tale, set in a different world of Ramar, in Kingdom of, you guessed it, Antara. The game begins on the ship that William Escobar, son of governor of city of Pianda, is sailing on to meet with his fiancé. The seas, it seems, are not friendly to our young noble, and the ship is attacked by pirates. During the commotion, William, along with another traveler, manages to escape in a lifeboat. The traveler, however, ends up being mortally wounded. And just before he dies, he entrusts William with a mystical medallion, warning him of a conspiracy against the entire empire. A little while later, William meets a young and talented magician, Aaron, whose recently manifested power is unexpectedly huge, and after sharing the news with him, they both decide to seek William's father's advice on how to deal with the unsettling information and how to stop the sinister plot. The story takes a while to gain traction, but is overall pretty decent and rewarding to complete. The dialogues seem a bit off, though. Hard to tell why, but they seem a bit out of place. As if they were written as an afterthought that was added to a already completed plot. They're not bad enough to detract you from playing, but they tend to take you out of the experience from time to time, which is always unpleasant, especially in a role-playing game. Gameplay-wise, Antara is very similar to Krondor, a carbon copy of it really, allowing you to take full control of a party of free adventurers. Movement around the world takes place in first-person perspective 3D view and is real-time. Whenever combat occurs, however, game switches to a third-person view and turn-based format. The battles are very tactical and as demanding as they were in the original, and always happen in pre-assigned locations and dungeons, not truly random events in Dantara, which is good for some and a criminal omission for others. The engine seems to be taken straight out of the first game and polished slightly for the new age, but I wouldn't say that the graphics are much better. Krondor used popular at its time digitized presentation, Antara gets back to more artistic, hand-drawn RPG roots. That said, the quality of in-game assets is very varied, and they can as often look great as they can terrible. If you can put up with all that though, there's plenty enough RPG, story and fun combat to keep you entertained all the way through. And if you persevere and complete the game, you may find the ending to be rather satisfying. Hexen 2 is a medieval fantasy themed first person shooter and a third game in Heretic and Hexen series. It still takes place in the world of Furion, which was raided by the trio of demon brothers collectively known as the Serpent Raiders. Two of them were defeated in the previous game, so only one, the most powerful of them all, Eidolon, remains. 
and he's especially cool and deadly. To get to him, however, you'll need to defeat his four horsemen of the apocalypse, so his four generals first. The game world is stylistically varied and features four unique areas of medieval European, Mesoamerican, Egyptian and Greco-Roman themes. Each of them is composed out of interconnected stages between which you'll travel back and forth completing environmental puzzles and defeating hundreds upon hundreds of enemies. Fortunately, enemies don't respawn after being defeated, so traveling between far-off switches shouldn't put too much strain on your mana resources. Mana that is used as ammo slash fuel for your magical weapons. Same as in First Hexen, there's few classes to choose from, and this time they're the Paladin, who has a lot of vitality and specializes in melee weapons, Crusader, who's very defense-centric and with progress will even gain ability to heal himself, the Assassin, Critical Strike and Sneaking Master, and finally a Necromancer, rather weak physically, but eventually able to regain his power from defeated enemies warrior. Each of them will get access to four unique weapons throughout the game and class specific skills upon some of the level ups. The weapons can be powered up by acquiring so-called tomes of power, often unlocking new and more damaging attack patterns. Since Hexen 2 tries to implement role-playing elements into its loop a bit more than previous games did, attributes of all four classes raise upon level ups, and level ups themselves are based on accumulated experience points that you get for killing monsters. It's not often that the sequel is better than the original was, but in the case of Hexen, that's precisely the case. It looks better, it sounds better, it's more varied and feature-rich, and most importantly, more fun to play. So if you like FPSs and RPG or fantasy themed games too, it's definitely a title not to miss. Hercules. Disney's Hercules, dare I say it, is one of the best licensed movie tie-in games of the 90s. Perhaps in the top 3. Bold statement, I know, but you can't really dispute personal opinions as these are like asses. Everyone's got their own, and it's more important to them than anyone else's is. Hercules generally follows the plot of the movie more or less, and places you in the shoes of our demigod, soon to be full-fledged superhero god Hercules. Why superhero? Cause if you think about it, he kinda was. Ancient perhaps, sandals wearing, that's for sure, but superhero nonetheless. So, you play as Hercules, son of Zeus, and the physically strongest man in the world in his time. Your task, should you choose to accept it and play the game, is to complete a series of heroic deeds and overcome various obstacles to prove your strength, courage and most importantly, that you deserve your spot at the Olympus. To become one of THE gods and not puny demigods or mortals even. Hercules is an action-adventure that mixes gameplay styles and even genres a little too, to serve a very exciting, action-packed and most importantly fun title that gamers of all ages can enjoy. So, some levels see you running inside view fighting your buddies seeking for pickups and countless hidden secret areas, like in a typical for the time platformer, while in others you racing down the road collecting items and avoiding enemies, or doing something completely different. You never know what and when to expect with Hercules, and it's precisely what keeps the game fresh all throughout. Not to mention bosses which are just fantastic, beautifully designed and animated and really, really fun to beat. So the variety is definitely one of the strongest points of Hercules, but so is its presentation, which for the most part looks as if it was taken straight from the movie and never fails to have you impressed with its details and stylistic choices. Disney's artists' talents were definitely not wasted in this one. Sounds and music are impressive too, but not as immediately noticeable and straight in your face as the graphics are. The controls are rather easy to learn and master, and our hero has a whole range of attacks and combos that he can pull off, and can also obtain upgrades along his adventure, like a helmet of invincibility or swords of lightning or fire to name a few. To summarize, Disney's Hercules is beautiful, incredibly playable title that the whole family can enjoy, young and old, thin and fat, smart and not as much, everyone. And thanks to its variety in levels, bosses and tons of secrets, it's also one of the games that offers a much longer staying power because it doesn't feel as repeatable as most others in the genre do. Mortal Kombat Trilogy is my third most favorite 2D Mortal Kombat, after first and second respectively, and the only other than the first that I really enjoyed completing. I hated single player in the second. Computer cheated, and it's been proven more than once. The link to one of the cases will be in the video description if you're curious. And while I don't mind the challenge, having played against the CPU that actively plays ignoring the game's inner mechanics and rules that you're always a subject to, is not fun. It was great against a friend, let's make that clear, but not on your own. Anyway, since we're on the subject of the trilogy and not any other, it's obviously a 2D vs fighting game combining characters from the first three titles for an ultimate fighter matchup of the 90s. And you can play as literally any of the characters that we saw in previous games. So Kano, Sub-Zero, Scorpion, Liu Kang, Johnny Cage, Raiden, Sonya, Reptile, Baraka, Jax, Kitana, Mylina, Kung Lao, Shang Tsung, Sindel, Sector, Striker, Nightwolf, Shiva, Smoke, goddammit, there's plenty of them. 
Rain, Jade, Ermac, second Liu Kang, because why the hell not? Noob Saibot, second, this time unmasked and less lore friendly Sub Zero, Cyrax, second Smoke in Cyber Ninja form, whatever that may mean, Cabal, Goro, Kintaro, Motaro, Bolo Yang, and Shao Kahn. And only one of the last four former bosses is not in the game. Can you guess which one? He may have been a unit in his own right, but definitely not present in the series in any shape or form. Each of the included over 30 characters have their moves, fatalities and looks sourced from their own games and they play as well as they originally did. Backgrounds are also a combination of old and new and are as fantastic as the cast of fighters is. Objectively speaking, the trilogy is the very best to the iteration in the way too long by now running series. Personally, I love the first game the most, but I'm biased towards it and this bias is filled with gallons of nostalgia and familiarity and nothing else really. If I was to metaphorically stand aside and compare them all, Trilogy was the best, at least when it comes to variety, features and responsiveness of controls. One thing that it fails at, at least in my opinion, and sadly that's also a very important thing for me personally, is the atmosphere. I just feel nothing when playing Trilogy, as compared to the first two titles that not only gave me shivers with their very climatic musical tunes at their respective title screens, but also captivated with their intros. In first, with the story and genesis of the the tournament described on a Goro themed background and then short clips of all fighters playing out their moments of glory. And in second, much simpler, with the starry sky and slowly starting storm, cutting through it with lightning and leaving Roman numeral 2 in the dark blood red coloring. They were both short and not sophisticated in any definition of the word, but epic feeling inducing in the same time, if that makes any sense. Oh, and obviously the sound design of both is something I will never forget. But if I was to go off my memory only, I could not tell you nothing at all about Trilogy's startup splash title screen or the accompanying tune. I have literally no idea how it starts or sounds. All that aside, personal feelings especially, Mortal Kombat Trilogy is a really competent, fun and bucketfuls of blood spilling fighter that will no doubt keep you and your friends entertained and competing for weeks on end. Or will end those friendships over a disagreement who will get to play a Sub-Zero in the first hour. Both options are equally as feasible. Star Wars Jedi Knight Dark Forces 2 is a sequel to 1995's Dark Forces, you know, THE FPS Star Wars game, and takes place directly after the events of the movie Return of the Jedi. It is also still predominantly a first-person shooter, but with an option to switch into third-person mode, which is an interesting but generally speaking unnecessary addition. You play as Kyle Katarn, a former mercenary and an ally to the rebels who discovers that he has a potential to become a Jedi. So he embarks on the quest to find a lightsaber and learn the techniques of the Force. In the same time, evil Lord Herrick, who is responsible for death of Kyle's father, is searching for a quote-unquote treasure of his own, a mythical valley of the Jedi where according to the legends his Dark Force powers could be unleashed in full. Unlike most other shooters of the time, Dark Forces 2 isn't linear but offers a deep and engaging branching story backed by an excellent source material. So while perhaps there's no really meaningful choices to make in the game, it doesn't feel like it's a one playthrough type of an experience as it branches out and allows for a solid dose of replayability and even multiple endings to boot. While you spend most of the in-game time shooting, you'll eventually be able to wield the lightsaber and even gain access to plethora of force powers. Like force choke for instance, which is hella fun to pull off as you can imagine. And since we're on the subject, there are three kinds of powers that you can learn while playing. Light, naturally, as that's what most Jedis use, dark, because they're deadly and fun, and neutral, so that there's a balance in the force. Light force is mainly used for healing, dark is for various attacks like the aforementioned choke, force throw of objects and the likes, and neutral powers enhance and expand your set of physical abilities, like speed, jumping, etc. Interestingly enough, while there are 14 powers in the game to learn overall, if you decide not to mix them and only focus on one of the three paths, you'll be granted a chance to learn an additional bonus force power. Dark Forces 2 is chock full of video sequences with live actors that complement the story and push it forward. Overall, Jedi Knight Dark Forces 2 is an excellent title, a gem for fans of Star Wars and a decent chock full of action shooter for others. So, whether you're a fan of the saga or not, it's worth a playthrough. FIFA Soccer Manager is EA's very first football manager and while it may not have been feature rich enough to compete with giants of the genre, I don't think that it ever aimed to. I believe that it was made to be more user friendly, easy approachable and fun. To lure those who were vaguely interested in a subject but never managed to get through high entry point of games like Championship Manager and the likes. But just because FIFA Soccer Manager was made to include non-hardcore fans and newbies in its circle of potential players, it doesn't mean that it was deliberately made bad, lacking or boring. In fact, I kinda liked it. 
And if I'm to be honest, from time to time, I'm happy to put away my spreadsheets and just have fun and go for something that will not squeeze the last drops of processing power out of me. So, FIFA Soccer Manager offered 12 leagues in 5 different countries, 4 divisions in England and 2 in Germany, Italy, Scotland and France. There are also over 7,500 players in its database, many from outside of playable leagues, so that the international competitions could be simulated. And your team can be improved by both, training of existing players and purchase of the new ones too. There's quite a few tactical options in the game as well, like ability to assign players to any position, setting of the team orders and playstyle and coverage of each of the positions. It's perhaps nothing new to the genre, but definitely a welcome inclusion for a more newbie-friendly title. The matches can be either simulated instantly or observed in an isometric view with all the players following their orders and assuming positions correctly. Even more so, the match engine featured 8000 frames of animation and over 120 different plays to depict the on-pitch action more accurately than any other manager did to date. And that's something that is often overlooked when talking about FIFA Soccer Manager, but definitely worth acknowledging to give it justice. While FIFA Soccer Manager focuses on management, dropping most business sides of the genre entirely, it strangely enough gives a lot of attention to the stadiums with its included stadium builder. It features over 300 individual different pieces that can be used, allowing you to customize your grounds to your heart's content. From tiniest of stadiums to huge monstrosities of few hundred thousand seats in total. It's interesting, though if I'm to be honest, largely unnecessary addition and something simpler would suit the package better. FIFA Soccer Manager is not a game hardcore fans of the genre will go for. And since they're a rather vocal offshoot of all gamers, I'm sure that they're ready to complain about it for hours on end. But if you look at it through eyes of an inexperienced footy fan, it can be quite fun, even if a bit demanding. The second half of the 90s was still a time when Activision was known for creative and fun games and not controversies and toxic working environment for which it is infamous currently. Well, also Microsoft buyout, but that's a subject for another video. And to be clear, I'm all for it. Interstate 76 is perhaps one of Activision's most unique outings for the time. In essence, it's a Mad Max adjacent scenario set in alternative 1970s US in a post-apocalypse-like setting. According to the game's plot, sometime before the game's grim present, US government failed completely. The states fell into ruin because of the global oil crisis and the rest of the world soon followed. American Southwest became the wasteland ruled, controlled and raided by various motorized armed gangs. You play as Groove Champion, and your one and only mission is to avenge your sister Jade's untimely demise at the hands of one of the gangs. Having inherited her custom-built Picard Piranha, a fictional name plastered to a car you'll no doubt recognize when playing, you turn to Vigilante Justice and aim to bring pain and suffering to the responsible, preferably in a healthy mixture of both before killing them eventually. The main story is divided into 17 entirely scripted missions and set across open-ended trackless areas of the wasteland. To unleash the destruction worthy of your personal mission, you'll naturally need to arm and upgrade your vehicle, and you can do that with various numerous weapons, turrets, grenade launchers and mines. So, you know, the answer to a question what every car in Mad Max needs. Interstate never aimed to be realistic, to follow the history or rules of our world, but it more than makes up for it with its unmistakably 70s atmosphere, bucketfuls of it in fact. The game's alternate 70s are all about the music, muscle cars, flashy clothes and era-specific gestures and behavior of all the characters that you meet and interact with. The game uses 70s from all its ones and zeros and does a hell of a job of that. It's a pleasure to witness and to play. Especially that Interstate 76's style perfectly integrates with its story, mixing numerous cutscenes with interesting and well-fitting context-wise missions to create a coherent story of revenge shown through the eyes of our protagonist, Groove. What's worth noting, even if it has nothing to do with the plot, is the pretty decent game engine that simulates handling and collision physics pretty accurately, at least for the time that the game released here. So, if you enjoyed those types of post-apocalyptic dystopian experiences, there's probably only a few other of a similar quality released in or around 1997. Hellfire, aka Diablo Hellfire, is an expansion pack to your prior single biggest hit and an all-time cult classic, Diablo. And even though it was not developed in-house by the Blizzard themselves and outsourced to synergistic software, it turned out to be a bullseye too and a pretty fun addition to already excellent base game. Interestingly enough, Hellfire did not require you to have a Diablo installed on your hard drive and all it needed to run was the original Play CD in your optical drive. And by 1997 it was a good thing, as the game was rather large and hard disks weren't exactly cheap. Hellfire adds two new dungeons to the game, the Demon Crypt and Festering Nest, and updates the base game with most of its new features, like new items, weapons, spells, enemy creatures and bosses. 
the demon crypt is where the demon Nakrul resides, a former lieutenant of Diablo, now evil in his own right terror of all nearby areas. And the area is as beautiful as it is creepy, well fitting into the overarching Diablo's art style. The nest is an insect stylized hive-like dungeon filled with team appropriate enemies and a new boss creature called the Defiler. It may not be as immediately fitting graphically addition to the game, having strong sci-fi inspired vibes about it, but it's a welcome even if a bit out of place refresher in terms of its presentation. What's more, Hellfire adds a new player class of monk that uses staff weapons and is pretty good at an unarmed combat as well. He's a decent caster to boot too. Other than that, there are also oils, adding special magical effects to weapons, and runes, which can be used as area of effect traps. Finally, the expansion unlocked Nightmare and Hell difficulty levels for single player mode, which while not necessary per se, was a welcome addition for veterans of original that wanted faster leveling and more challenging gameplay. While it's obviously advisable to create a new character for Hellfire, you can theoretically import your old one from base Diablo. The choice however comes with a pretty prominent inconvenience. The characters are moved to Hellfire without any weapons or gear whatsoever. And all that they have with them are their levels, XP and gold. Which can speed up the progress within the add-ons content, but it's far from a perfect solution. Hellfire sadly is entirely devoid of multiplayer of any kind and can only be played as a side adventure from within the single-player Diablo playthrough. It's disappointing, but should provide plenty enough fun to the fans of the original that they won't mind too much it not being a shareable experience. In the end, if you love Diablo, you love Hellfire. But if you didn't, it's not likely to change your opinion about it. Since I don't know how to pronounce the title of this game correctly, with its AE joined into a singular letter that whichever way I try I can't comprehend as anything else other than the AE like Fonz used to say, I'll call it the Dark Angel. It also sounds way better than anything else that comes from my mouth, so let's leave it at that. So, Dark Angel is a side view to the run and gun platformer with mixed fantasy and sci-fi themes. The Azrael and his army of demons plunge the world into total chaos and are striving to bring it to an end. Why does he do it? I suppose he can and it's Sunday and there's nothing better out there. The real reason will forever remain unknown. But fortunately, regardless of his motivation, there's one hero that never gives up and will stand in Azrael's way to stop him and bring his reign of terror to an end. You. Well, not you per se, but Karina, the titular Dark Angel, who you'll be in control of. And truth be told, she's pretty well versed to do that, if I say so myself. Not only is she a master of any and all weapons capable of firing deadly projectiles at high speed, but also possesses a series of powers, unlike you've seen today. So there's the mutator power, which allows her to transform ammo into medikits and vice versa. Then there are psychic attack and reflection. First is powerful offensive skill and second reflects enemy laser shots. Teleport coin allows her to instantly teleport to where it landed after being tossed. And finally, energy wave damages all enemies near you. Kinda like bomb does in most other arcade games. Dark Angel is controlled similarly to much more well-known and arguably a lot better abuse, so you move with the arrows and aim and shoot with the mouse, which as years of gaming have proved is a very comfortable and precise control scheme. The levels are rather large and full of hidden secret areas that you'll need to find passages to, often in the least expected locations. So keep your eyes open, and if something looks like it may lead somewhere, even if its surroundings don't support the notion that that somewhere may be there after all, investigate the hell out of it anyway. It may not be a coincidence. Dark Angel is awful looking. Today, it didn't age very well. But back then, it could have probably be called attractive. Still, if you're to approach it now, I'd suggest not expecting too much from the presentation and just doing it for the gameplay, which in itself is not great too, I'm afraid. At least initially, as Dark Angel is a game that requires a bit of time investment before you begin to appreciate it. So, should you do it and try it out? I think it's best that you decide based on the footage and not have me in this particular case advise you about it. Personally, I don't see myself coming back to it ever, but I can imagine how someone else might. Pretty cool start to 1997, isn't it? Most of these are if not good, then at least decent, and the rest of the year, believe it or not, seems to keep a similarly high level of releases. But that's just my opinion. Whether you concur or disagree, I won't know until you let me know in the comments below. If you like the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. Smash them if you have to, it helps more than you could ever know. Also, I would like to thank you and all my amazing Patreon and YouTube members for helping this channel keep going. And last but definitely not least, I would like to thank all the wonderful folks who record and upload playthroughs, let's plays and other retrocentric videos here on YouTube, because they help to preserve the games that would have otherwise belong forgotten. So thank you.